Hallelujah. Mm. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. How many of you ever heard about unity before? Before Dawson taught this morning. How many of you ever heard about being thankful before Melvin taught this morning? How many of you guys ever heard, thought, heard about fasting before Jonas taught this morning? So you didn't learn anything new this morning, did you? <laughs> How many of you ever heard about redemption? I have a message on redemption this morning. That's, we all heard about that already, right? So why do we keep hearing, listening, and reading, and teaching on these things we already heard about? Jacob, tell me the menu you had for on your, your whole day, your meal on Wednesday. The whole menu. <laughs> <laughs> probably? <laughs> you said probably. You don't remember, do you? For sure. So what, why did you bother eating that food that day? Because I wanted to. Because <laughs> it was life. Exactly. Exactly. We don't remember these meals that we eat in detail. Yeah, you probably did have eggs. Very likely you did. But you know, I can't go back and say exactly what I had every meal. I know some of the things I ate yesterday, and some of the things I know I eat because that's what we eat. But you can't, you can't just always remember everything that you ate, but yet you keep on eating because if you, would, if you wouldn't, your, your body would cease to function. And that is why we continue talking about, we're going to talk about unity some more. We're going to talk about being thankful some more. We're going to talk about redemption. We're going to talk about these things again. And if you live to be 80 or 90 years old, you're going to hear about those things many, 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 many times. And the same way as that food that you take into your body keeps your body alive, these things that we talk about that are in the Word of God keep the spiritual side of you alive. And you must do that. You must keep that spiritual side alive. Sometimes you get a really special meal. Sometimes you go to a friend's house and it's a meal that's just a wow kind of an experience. It does happen. Those you'll remember. And that creates something. It doesn't necessarily create a lot more life, but it's, there's a memory that goes with that. Sometimes you, read, you pick up a book and it's like, oh yeah, you know, interesting book. Everyone will tell you pick up a book and say, wow, these are some new insights. This is deep. That's what revival meetings are for. The tent meetings that we had here in the New Holland this summer, most of those concepts and themes and doctrines we'd all heard before. But I know, at least I did, I, can, I know a lot of other people did too. You came away from those two weeks of meetings and there was a fire in your spirit that hadn't been there before because you just had a wow experience if you were into the spiritual thing. So that's why we keep fellowshipping. That's why we keep going to church. That's why we keep assembling with the saints. Because you must have that spiritual food to keep you spiritually alive. Amen. So I'm going to talk about redemption this morning. And the way I see, Jesus is the redeemer. Hallelujah. He's the redeemer. And what I see in redemption is there's for sure three areas of our lives that we had to be redeemed from. To live in the full potential that God wants us to live in. One is we need to be redeemed from the curse. The fall of man there in the garden. The curse that came. We need to be redeemed from that curse. Right now we're still under that thing. Because we're still on the earth. The earth is cursed. We need to be redeemed from sin. And if you've been born again and you're being sanctified by the Holy Spirit, then you are in that. You've been redeemed from that sin. You've been pulled out from it. And then, finally, we need to be redeemed from this current world. This earth as we know it, this environment, this world as we know it, we are the, the earth itself is groaning for redemption. And there will be a day when we are redeemed from out of this time and earth. And it will be we will begin to live in an existence that is not like this one. Now I'm sure there's more things to be redeemed from. But that's a general redemption. We need redemption from the curse, from sin, and from this current world. And those are the three things that I want to explore here this morning. We all recognize where the curse came from, unless you've never heard it before. But the curse came from Adam and Eve had been given a place to live, created and put into the garden where they had everything they needed. And they had been given a commandment that they should eat, should not, they could eat of every, 
everything that was in there, but they could not eat of that tree in the middle, which was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And when they ate of that tree, it was disobedient to God, and so they were cut off from God in the relationship that they had, and God cursed the earth at that point. Um, with that curse, there's things that happened there with that curse. There's curse that, that came on man, a curse that came on the earth. And also with that curse came the promise of redemption. So let's explore that just a little bit to get a foundation of, of where we're at. If you want to, you can turn to Genesis 3. You get a foundation of what I want to share here this morning. Before this happened, before they sinned and disobeyed God, I believe Adam and Eve could go out and they could eat, pick fruit from any tree or plant that they wanted to. And I believe it was very, very good. I believe that that fruit was in its fullest potential. There probably never was any sweeter fruit. There probably was never any more full vegetable or anything that they ate. It was full. It was as, as good as it could be. But after that, it, it, was, it was subject to the curse that God had spoken out on the earth because of disobedience. And that food, the trees, the plants had to fight diseases and those kinds of things. Therefore, it didn't... It wasn't as full in its nutrients as it was before. Here's where here's when the curse happened. Is after here in Genesis three verses start sixteen to nineteen. I'm going to read a small portion of it there. He had cursed the serpent because of his deception. Then he turned to the woman, and the Lord said to the woman, "I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception in sorrow. Shalt thou bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule rule over thee." And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast not hearkened unto, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat the bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it thou wast taken, for dust thou art and unto dust thou shalt return. After they disobeyed God, and this curse was spoken out, I believe they had to go out and till the ground. Yes, there was some fruit that they ate off the trees, but I don't believe that Adam was tilling the ground with some kind of a handmade tool to plant seeds into it to eat fruit or food that came off that seed before the curse. The food that they had was it, they didn't have to till the ground for it. And the, the ground did, before that did not bring forth weeds and thistles and things that make life hard for the farmer. They weren't there before. Now they were part of his challenge to bring forth fruit and food to eat. Death, disease, sickness, accidents, um, prickles, Things like that are also part of that curse. Man was created in the beginning. They were created to live eternally. And after they sinned, God said, this isn't going to work. And he, and he, and he shortened. He, first of all, they had to die because they sinned. And then he began to even shorten their span of their life. In the Old Testament, prior to the flood, many people lived hundreds of years. I still can't wrap my mind around that. I just I don't get it. I don't need to either. But after the flood, he, he limited them at about 120 years. Well, there's very few people even in today's age that live 120 years. 80 and 90 is there's a large, good percentage that end up there. And that shortening their lifespan was because of the curse. With that came disease, sickness, and those kind of things. In John 10.10, 10, uh, the devil comes, he shows there, Jesus said, the sa Satan is not come but for to kill, steal, and destroy. But I am come that you may have life and you ha may have it more abundantly. And that's, that, that, all that stuff is part of the curse. And we have not been redeemed from that part of it yet. We still have to work for our food. 
we, uh, if you're a farmer or uh, someone who works in the fields, you still have to deal with diseases in your fruits and plants. You have to till the soil. You have to break it open. You have to put the seed in the ground. You have to do that with your hand, and you have to go out and make it happen. And the uh, diseases and sicknesses and those things, they are part of that curse. And I believe as long as the earth stands, those two things are going to go on. Maybe more or less in some degree in some people's lives, depending how you are and how close your relationship is with the Lord. Another part of the curse is spiritual blindness. Relationship with God was cut off or limited and broken relationships in other areas of your life. Let's look at Matthew 13, 10 to 17. Jesus was speaking there. He was teaching the multitudes. He was speaking in parables. He did not speak plainly when they asked him questions. Many times he answered it with a question. He did not give them clear answers and did not clearly open up their understanding in all the things that he was talking about. Then his disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? They asked, why are you doing that? Why don't you just plainly talk to these people? Why don't you make it clear what you're about? Why don't you help them understand what we already understand about you? And even their, their understanding was limited. Jesus answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away even that which he hath. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled, fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, their eyes they have closed, that at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. And so part of that, part of that curse that came in the Garden of Eden was was also bringing that this a spiritual blindness. Adam and Eve could remember the relationship they had with God before they sinned. But their children did not have a relationship like that. And they could not remember ever communicating with God like that. And so Adam and Eve, uh, uh, their descendants came under that blindness. There was an area of relationship that they could not go because the curse had come. We are still in that era where spiritual blindness from the curse brought on by sin of man and brought in by the deceit of Satan is holding people back from understanding the truth of God's word. Mm -hmm. Now you don't have to stay stuck there because the Holy Spirit has been released. The prophets of God, even in the Old Testament, they would seek God, they would turn to God, prophets or individuals. They would seek God and turn to God, and God would move. But if a person does not press in, then he angshovende. You don't seek after God. You'll stay under that thing. Spiritual blindness will prevail. Someone who doesn't open the word of God, someone who walks in a false religion and is determined to stay there and is not seeking after God, they stay in that blindness. Because it's part of the curse. It's almost, it's almost like, because the curse was spoken out, because man disobeyed and sinned, it's almost like it's an automatic. You're under it automatically. Yeah, that's right. It'd be nice if it would automatically be under the blessing. But we're not. Man is not. You're still under that curse. And you need to seek in. You need to press in. Another area. Redemption from sin. Once a person realizes that you're under sin, you're trapped. Like it says there in Ephesians 2, or Ephesians 1, where we are dead in sins and trespasses. A man, uh, many people realize that. I believe that many people in the world realize that. Many people in the past have realized that, that deadness. And I've just continued to walk in it. But many have not. 
Many have realized the weight of that sin. And they have realized that they were dead in their sins and trespasses. And they remembered somewhere, they remembered that there's a God. Maybe it was just in their spirit that they remembered it. And they pressed in. And they found truth. And they started to walk in truth. And they got a hold of the word of God and started to learn what is true. And began to rise up out of that sin. But when they came to understand Christ, when we came to understand Christ and repent of our sins and put our faith in him, then you are redeemed from the curse of the law that is on sin. You don't walk under that law anymore. You then walk under grace. Consequences of sin bring confusion, depression, darkness of mind, lost, a lostness, not knowing what you believe, not knowing who you are, and many of these things. They come because of that darkness that comes on a person. With the consequences of sin, there, there is in, uh, in Galatians 6, I think it's Galatians 6 verse 7. deceived God is not mocked for whatsoever a man soweth that shall he also reap <clears throat> for he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption but he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting and let us not be weary in well doing for in due season we shall reap if we faint not as we therefore have opportunity let us do good unto all men especially unto those who are of the household of faith so there's this law of sowing and reaping. And I'm going to switch just a little bit now from coming out from under that curse. What does it take to come out from under that curse? The well, one is the repentance of your sin. Once you recognize your sin in your life, repenting of it, coming to Christ in faith, and then walking that new life, walking that life that's been turned around, walking that life that's been changed. And I look through this room here, and most of the people sitting here, I've heard your testimonies. I've heard a testimony of what, what life was like when you lived in sin. And I heard your testimony of coming to, to, to Christ, recognizing the sin, putting your faith in Christ, turning from your sin, and you don't live the life like you lived before. That's because you, there you've been redeemed, you've been taken out, you've been pulled out from under the curse that is on sin. This verse in Galatians 6, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Some people believe that the bad seeds that you sow in your life, those seeds, from those seeds, you will reap a harvest for the rest of your life. I don't believe that. If I put some seeds in my garden, and I either didn't pay attention to what they were, what I put in, or... It looked like a, a plant that we usually eat, and it comes up and it's a weed. Or something I can't eat. Do I have to wait all summer to let that thing grow to its fruition and then starve because there was no food off, off of that plant? No. You can till it down. And say, oh, that's not what I planted. I don't like that seed. You get your tiller out, and you disc it down, and you put the right kind of seed in. <coughs> Farmer, their neighbor at our, our place this summer... This spring, he went out and he planted good seed in his field. He planted four or five acres of a whole of cornfield there. And it was the right kind of seed. It was good seed. But he made a mistake. While the corn was still about that tall, he sprayed it with the wrong thing. And he killed a whole field of corn. Mm -hmm. Total loss? Nah. Not really. Just a couple weeks of time. Maybe about a month. The money that he put into the spray and the time that he spent out there spraying it and then the time that he had to invest to go out and redo it and the money that he invest in some more seed he didn't reap the con he didn't reap the full consequences of his mistake because he corrected it right away as soon as he saw the mistake he corrected it and 
some of the corn must have been strong or something because it missed the spray and it continued to grow anyway. And the, through the summer, the early stages of the summer, you had some corn this tall, just a stalk here and there, while the rest was way down here. But they caught up with each other. By the time it was time to harvest, it was all the same. So just because you have sown some bad seeds in your life, don't mean that you need to reap the consequences of that sin or that bad seed all your life. Right. Come out from under that thing. There's <coughs> redemption. That's right. You can be redeemed from any of the bad seeds you have sown. Some have longer consequences. Some have shorter. Mm -hmm. But they can all be changed. Another part of coming out from under the curse of sin, coming out from it is Romans 12, too. There, Paul was writing to the Romans, and he was getting them to correct the direction of their life, correct what they were believing before, correct and go in the right direction. And there he says, And be ye not conformed to the world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, so you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. He said, Don't be conformed to the things around you. That's what you were. But come out from that and let your mind be transformed so you don't need to continue walking in that. Let's go to the Ephesians. Ephesians is a very good, good one on this coming out from under that curse. The curse that's on sin. Start reading here in Ephesians 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us to the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glory, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom, meaning in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, and according to his good pleasure, that which he proposed in himself. So all of this is, is prior to this happening, the person was not part of the, of the, of the, the family of God. He was not walking according to the good pleasure of God's will. He was not walking to the praise of the glory of His grace. He was not accepted in the beloved. He was not walking in redemption. He was not walking under the forgiveness of sins. He did not know the mystery of God's will. But you can come out from under that because Jesus is the Redeemer and He pulls you out from under that and He gives you a complete different walk. Different destination. Different purpose, different spiritual aspect. Everything becomes different. Ephesians 2. And you, the ones of you that repented and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you he hath quickened, meaning revived, gave new life. You, the ones of you who are dead in sins and trespasses, wherein in time past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, and the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience among whom we all had our conversation or way of life in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath even as others. There is that automatic. We were by nature the children of wrath because of the curse. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he has loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath revived us together with Christ by grace, you are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Why? That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So that is what it takes. It's faith in Christ. It takes us out from under the curse that came on sin. That curse we're not under anymore. If you've been born again and set free, you are not under that the law that is on sin because you walk under grace.
The one that I really get excited about. Getting delivered from that bondage of sin. That was awesome. I can still go back and remember the excitement and the passion that I felt in recognizing that I'm not under the, the, the law of my past sin. I'm no longer under the guilt. I could feel it shift. Mm -hmm. I could feel it leave. That was an exciting period of my life. Mm -hmm. I still walk there. It's just that when it's fresh and new, it's like that meal that your friends serve. It's like it was a wow experience. There's one more ahead of us yet. And it's going to be a tremendous wow experience. And it is when the believers, those who've been redeemed, are totally and finally and completely, once and for all, delivered from this sin-cursed earth. Taken to be with the bride, take, or we are the bride, taken to be with Jesus to the marriage supper of the Lamb, and then to live eternally in the new heaven and earth. Back to what God intended in the first place. Redemption is all about buying something back that you lost before. God had a plan when he sent Adam and Eve down here. He gave them a commandment. He gave them a, a purpose. They were supposed to come and fill the earth. Subdue it. The devil came in and he brought the curse in, messed it all up, and we're still not what God, the earth is still not what God intended for it to be. It never reached it yet. It, it looks like if you look at if you look at what God intended, if you see the blueprint, just the blueprint of what God intended for the earth when he made it, and you would see, you would get a vision of the very beginning of it before sin. And then you would take a look at what you see today in the cities and in the slums and in wherever. You would take a look around you. And you would really get it in your spirit of what sin has done to mankind and the earth. You would say, whoa, it's a complete failure. If you looked at what God really intended. And it would be a complete failure if it hadn't been for Jesus coming in there and making that plan of redemption real that those who want to press in and seek after God can actually be redeemed and pulled out of that thing. But the truth is, God is, Jesus came and he is going, he is going to redeem God's original plan. <coughs> there will indeed be, a, be a, a place where the people of God will live on and they will live there sin-free, disease-free, relationship issues-free. Your food you will not be tilling the ground for. You will be eating it off of the trees and the vine, and, and you will be provided for and cared for by the Lord Jesus Christ Amen. himself. Amen. Hallelujah. That redemption is still in front of us. Let's go to First Thessalonians 4. we walk in this redeemed state those of us who've been born again we are now walking in a redeemed state and it is it is a blessing to walk in that redeemed state you have that song almost ready here yeah <coughs> don't, don't play it yet that to walk in that redeemed state now if i think back to where i walked before i remember the confusion the weight of sin the guilt of sin which is a burden i remember the uh, the uh, trying to somehow believe that I could actually go to heaven but realizing that if Christ were come back I, I was so fearful of the second return of Christ I was so fearful of that trumpet blowing there were so many things that were just bringing that bondage into my life even though there had been a shift from the outward works of unrighteousness I had religiously conformed to a life that was much better I was still under that thing when I came to faith in Christ and I received that redemption through Jesus Christ, I began to walk in a freedom and a newness of life and the things of Scripture came alive. And we, as the redeemed of the earth, we, we're not redeemed from the earth, but we're redeemed from the sin. Yet We who've been redeemed, we can, re, we, can walk in, we can rejoice in that redemption. 
We can rejoice because we have been redeemed. We've, been, we've come out from under that thing, and we can reach out to people. All of us in this room that have been ministering to people, you have seen people that you've been ministering to, and you, and you see them step up and reach new levels. Walk in places they didn't walk before. Coming up out of the sin and depression of their lives. And when you talk to the believers, I don't care where it is all over the world. We meet them in the marketplace. I meet people down at market where we work. And these people are happy. They're excited about Jesus. They might see our tracks laying on the table or they see something in us or they begin to talk about the Lord Jesus and what God has done for them. And we connect in the spirit and we connect with words. Why? Because we're of the redeemed. Hallelujah. Amen. We have a common joy. We're not subject to everything that happens in this world. Yeah, we are, we're in it, so we experience what goes on. But we are not completely subject to it because we know that whether we live until Christ comes back or whether we die before Christ comes back, when we leave this earth, we come into the presence of God because we are of the redeemed. And that creates an excitement in us. It creates a reason for us to have compassion for the... The sinner who's still stuck in his sins, he doesn't need to stay there. And you know that you have a message for him. Go ahead. Let's just listen to this song and just rejoice. Just let it soak into your spirit. <clears throat> city of Jehovah, and in perfect harmony, they will begin humming a new song, a song composed by God, arranged for his children, as the saved by grace approach the land of their dream, the hosts of heaven will step aside, even the angels will be silent, for they cannot sing this new song, for it is a song reserved for voices that once cried out for the Redeemer, those washed in the blood of the Lamb, that is us. We are the redeemed. 
It's as if we could say the half has never been told yet. If we think this redemption that we have experienced so far is glorious, it's not even half been told yet. And yet if you didn't experience the first redemption, if you didn't experience what he was just talking about, you wouldn't reach the second one. You would, never, you would not reach that redemption from the curse of this earth. You would not live in that new earth. You would perish with the old. First Thessalonians 4, verse 13. There will be an event that marks this transition. This final redemption is going to be announced, not in some newspaper headlines, and not some text that you're going to get on your phone, but it's going to be blasted with a trumpet from the sky. But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which have died before you, that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Even so, them also which died in Christ, God will bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord Jesus shall not prevent them which have died before us. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort ye one another with these words. This, this transition from being the final redemption off of this earth is going to be marked by that trumpet blast and that shout of victory. Prior to that trumpet sounding and that shout of victory, there's going to be a trial like the earth has never experienced before. In Matthew 24 and Matthew 25, it gives the signs of the times. It gives, in Revelation, to get, it shows things are going to be coming into place. And I believe the Christians and the believers, those who are redeemed, are going to come into a, a time of being hard-pressed, persecuted, trampled down, where it seems like evil is going to try to prevail. And right now, here today, we just... In our minds, most of us are experiencing a victory with, with Trump being elected. Mm. There's, a, there's, a, there's a victory that we experience in this. But this, to me, it was exciting and it was joyful. But this announcement that, that is, going to, is right here in the Word of God yet is going to be far greater than anything we've experienced yet because of the pressure that's going to come on the believers first. And if you, keep your, if you keep your mind on the victory, you keep your mind on Christ and your eternal home with Him, the trials won't be as overwhelming. They'll be there, but they won't be as overwhelming. And you know that as you press through, you have a reason to press through. And I don't know what it's going to be like. I don't know, if, I don't know what it's going to be like in those days. But I am picturing, according to what I read in Scripture, that it will be enough of a trial that the redeemed, the believers, are going to be longing for a break. Mm -hmm. It'll, a little like we, are, like we are here in America. We're longing for a break from some of this crazy stuff that was going on. And now we at least have hope that, yes, maybe we have a leader who will rise up and give us a break. This other victory that I'm talking about is not a maybe. It is an absolute. It is a sure. If you stay faithful in Christ, 
through the trials that come, even if it's persecution across the whole world, even if it's that, that hard pressure coming from the authorities or whatever, whatever that all entails, the victory, the victor is Jesus Christ. He has won. And the victory is sure. It's not a maybe. What maybe could happen in this country and how much better it could be, all that's a maybe. We like to have hope and we like to have visions forward. But when you look into eternity and you look into the word of God and the promises of God, they're not maybes. It's a sure. And so if you let yourself picture just a bit of what the oppression might be like and what the believers might be crying out for in those last days. And then, in the midst of that, then is when you hear that trumpet blowing. Then is when you hear that shout of victory. You're going to know it's a shout of victory. <laughs> the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. With the voice of the archangel and with the trump. With the trumpet of God. I like to put the word trumpet in there. Because the pictures that you see, if you see a painting of the second return of Christ, there is a trumpet. Someone is blowing a trumpet. And it's going to be glorious. One day soon after I was born again and filled with the Spirit, I was meditating on these joyous things of God. And I, I was thinking about the return of Christ. I, I'm not sure what was all going through my mind, but I was in my shop working and rejoicing. And a friend of mine... The neighbor came to my place and he pulled into the driveway and I could not see the vehicle and he lays on the horn <laughs> as he pulled in. And it shot from here all the way up to my mind. I was like, is that the trump of God? It was, it was, it was that quick. I knew it wasn't within a split second, but that's the first thing that went through me. And if that was an experience, that, that little excitement was a foretaste or just a tiny bit of the joy that's going to vibrate and shoot through your being when the actual trumpet of God is blown. Now what's interesting about this is the whole world will hear it at the same time. No one is going to question what it is. Neither the good or the evil. And that is why the believers, the redeemed, that is why, that is why it's going to be such a joyous experience. It is going to, because you're going to know what it is. Sometimes in this life we, we, we rejoice about something or we shout about something or we hear something. We're not exactly sure what it was about. Not that one. And the voice of the voice of the archangel, I don't know what he's gonna say. I think it's gonna be a victorious shout. And then it says, it says, we shall ever be with the Lord in the new heavens and the new earth. And his purpose. I don't know what he I don't know what he had planned for the earth in the beginning, except it was what you can read there with Adam and Eve. He made the earth, put them into it, to subdue it, and to fill it. So there's going to be activities in the new heaven and the new earth. It is not going to be a boring experience. It is going to be a perfect existence following a perfect plan of God in the first place. Now here on this earth we're so busy with if we're not ministering to people, we're we're working. And if we're not ministering to people or working, we're spending time with our family, and we're doing lots of, we're, there's lots of activities and things going on. And we have a hard time wrapping our mind around, well, if we don't, if, if, we're, if we're in heaven, in the new heaven and the new earth, and everything is perfect, we won't have to minister to anybody. No, because we'll all be ministered to by God. We won't have to be working as far as making payments and meeting schedules and, and, and the things that uh, tend to do with life today. We won't be doing that. Well, what are we going to be doing <laughs> for a couple years there? <laughs> and then a couple more. And then eternity beyond. I don't, I don't know. But it, it's not that important. The important thing is, is that we've been redeemed from sin in this, in this life. And that when this final shout, we will be redeemed from this earth. And with all of that, remembering that while we're still here, we can offer this message of redemption to others around us.
know that burn in our hearts to offer the message of redemption to those around us. Do we really care that much about the people around us? Do we really realize what God is actually doing in our day and age? You need to giving us a window of opportunity to minister and to bless and to empower. He's doing something even in America right now. You know, there's a shift coming to America. There was a demonic force that was coming down over our people, over over the Christians, over believers, over all that thing. There was there was a, there was a demonic force that was that was going to take every believer out in America. And God has allowed a shift to come forth. And my prayer, and my cry is that we would be open, our eyes would be open to what God's actually doing, because I believe the darkness was coming down so hard that that even the people couldn't see Christ, some of them. And I believe now, as things are starting to open up, you know, just last night I read that Trump elected a lady from Michigan and her husband to run the school systems. And this is somebody that doesn't believe in public schools. She's a Christian person that believes in private Christian education. And they're looking at giving, I understand, giving every person $8,000 per child to send them to the to school of their choice. And this has created quite a stir. And the reason I'm saying is it's time for Christians to wake up. Because this could be a turning point in the century. This could be a once in a lifetime event that can shift complete culture. Because according to Steve King, they would have so much place in, for schools to, to educate people like in Lancaster, they would have the finances. And they could take a person through a school for around $4,000. If they would get $8,000, they could take all kinds of people through schools. This, this group that, that Trump asked to, to run this spent $20,000 against this gay movement. And these people are worked up about it because they're afraid that they're going to completely eradicate the school system and bring Christianity and prayer back into the schools. And that's what their heart is. So we need to pray. But we also need to be willing to, to look what God is doing in America right now. And as we pray and, and God chooses to do things, because he's going to need people to step in and educate these people. This is our future. All these people, this could be a, a shift that could uh, that'll affect trillions of people. If these young men and women get educated on Christ rather than going to the public school system where they can't pray and everything else. So I'm, I'm, sh I'm sharing this with you. As, we're, as we stand here today, there's a shift that has come to America. And we need to be aware of it. We need to be aware of, of, of what God's doing. And we need to be aware of even, even the opportunities we have to speak to our, our brothers and sisters and our friends. Now to open up the Bible, it opened up to Isaiah 57. And, and, and the thing, verse 14 jumped out at me. It's a little different translation, but it says, The always present one says, Build a road, build a road, prepare the way, make the way clear for my people. God lives forever and his name is holy, he is high and lofty. I dwell in a high and holy place, but I would dwell, I also dwell with people who are contrite and humble in spirit. I give new life to the spirit of those who are humble. I give new life to those whose hearts are broken. I will not accuse forever, I will not always be angry. If I continue to be angry, then the spirit of mankind would grow weak in my presence. All mankind whom I have created would die. I was angry because they were dishonest in order to make money. I punished them and I turned away from them in anger. Nevertheless, they continue to do evil. And he goes on to say, There is no peace for evil people, says my Lord. But then verse 458, he says, Always the present one says, Yell, don't hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people the things they've done against me. Tell the household of Jacob their sins. Do we do that? Do we yell? Here's the prophet is saying, yell, speak it out. Tell them their sins. Don't hold back. Because if you tell them, they might see it, right? Tell the household of Jacob their sins. You can put another word in. Tell the Amish their sins. Tell the English their sins. Tell whatever. Tell the people what they're doing wrong. And as we speak that, I believe... I believe there's actually an unveiling. I believe there's a darkness being pushed back even right now. And, and you know, when you look at what the Leviathan spirit does in Proverbs 6, it talks about how it comes in to, to kill, steal, and destroy. And I believe there's an element that God is allowing this darkness to be pushed back. And I believe as we continue to speak these words, even now, I believe their eyes are going to be opened in a new way. I believe there's a shift coming that, that we need to be willing to, to get up and speak because they're listening. 
So then every day they might, God says then, in verse 2, every day they might come looking for me. Also they might want to learn my ways. They might want a nation that does what is right. But when the, why is he saying it? He says, if you yell and if you speak out, they might want this. But what happens if we don't speak out? What happens if we don't tell them about these things? Then he, God goes on and said, they might not abandon the justice of their God anymore. They might even ask me to act consistently on their behalf. They might want God to be near to them. These are the things God's asking us to do. God's asking us to speak it out. Because we know we have the redemption. And if we have been part of that, we want them also to experience this joyous new life. We need to recognize God's blessings and not just put them in a box. You know, there's some people that still don't believe there's a difference if Trump or Hillary would have got in to the believers. I believe there is. I believe there's a season that we have the opportunity to go out and to speak, to, speak the truth. And I believe there, there's an opportunity to bring prayer back to, to see children educated for God again. I don't know how long it's going to last. But let's seize this moment. Let's don't let this moment pass us by. Because if we miss this moment, we could miss millions of people that are in, end up spending life in, in hell or heaven. Isaiah 61 sort of jumped out to me. You know, we don't need to go out and, and try to tell the people some of these things. Isaiah 61 verse 9. It says, and their seed shall be known among the Gentiles, and their offspring among the people. All that see them, he's talking about believers, shall acknowledge them, that they are the seed which the Lord has blessed. That's what God has for us as we walk with God. The people around us will acknowledge that we have seed that the Lord has blessed. Do we realize the authority and the power that God has given us as we walk in faithfulness, and we walk in boldness, and we walk in vision? So let's keep our focus on Christ. Let's keep our vision pure. You know, when you stop and think about it, there's also this thing where a lot of people, they just want to keep that to themselves. And you know, that's the same thing that Peter and John, they, 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 they wanted up in the Mount of uh, Transfiguration. Peter said, this is a good place to be. Let's build an altar here. Let's build a temple. Let's just stay here. And isn't that what the believers have done too long? They come together in their little holy huddles and they just, let's just stay here. Let's keep it among ourselves. Let's, let's don't share what we have. But you know, when you read on in that scripture, when they came down to the bottom of the mountain, you know what was there? It was a demon-possessed boy that needed deliverance. It was people in bondage. And that's what God has for us. That they're out there is where these people are that need help. So we need to be willing to walk in that fullness. Because there's a day coming when, when, when things are going to shift. And God's doing a new work in our people. I know he is, and he's using a lot of different situations. I know this week we had an opportunity to spend a, to go out to Fox's Pizza. I just think it's got one with my wife's parents and the whole family to eat. It was mom's birthday and they invited us all out. And it was a real blessing. And through it all that day, the, we had a puppy that gave birth to little puppies. And she was, got sick and I wasn't sure what to do with her. But anyway, we ended up taking these puppies down to 